Welcome back. You are watching the constitutional challenge to Canada's marijuana laws in the cases of Malmo Levine, Kane, and Clay versus Her Majesty the Queen. Please note that these cases have been edited to fit the four-hour time limit of today's broadcast. Given the, the, that there are three appeals and some overlap uh, of, of issues, I, I, I think I should first take you to the roadmap to the respondent's submission, which appears on uh, page 32, starting on page 32 in paragraph 78 of the um, respondent's factum, uh, listing the, uh, the various positions that the uh, respondent takes with respect to the um, constitutional uh, matters that are in issue, both charter and division of, of powers. Um, there's a subsidiary ground uh, that I perhaps won't address orally. It's dealt with in the factum uh, raised by uh, the appellant, uh, Mr. Malmo Levine, with respect to the way in which the trial judge in his matter uh, proceeded, uh, essentially asking that uh, um, Malmo Levine and his co-accused uh, put forward their best case in terms of what they say the facts would be if they called their evidence and then saying that that didn't, uh, wasn't sufficient to grant them a, a remedy. Um, our position on that is that the, the Court of Appeal uh, went too far in saying that that, that was an error which uh, might in other circumstances uh, necessitate a, a new trial. Uh, we take the view that that was an appropriate exercise of the court's gatekeeper, the trial judge's gatekeeper function. Um, the, the, the last issue, in, which is referred to in paragraph 80, is the um, final point raised by my learned friend Mr. Burstein on behalf of the appellate Clay, and that's the, a matter of statutory interpretation as it relates to, uh, in his submission, the necessity that the Crown, um, in a marijuana case, or I suppose in any case involving a drug, uh, prove uh, an intoxicating quality to the actual substance. Um, that is an issue which uh, my colleague, Mr. Uh, Wilson, um, has a uh, carriage of. And uh, uh, if it uh, should transpire that the, the court need not uh, or doesn't wish to hear from the Crown on that point, uh, then uh, I won't s uh, cede time to him. Okay, I, I, I appreciate that for, for planning purposes. Uh, uh, Chief Justice, um, I'd like to come back for a moment to the uh, to the facts uh, and deal very briefly with them in view of some of the uh, comments and submissions that have made have been made to the to the court. Um, the first, and I, I must say, it did catch me by uh, considerable surprise, was the submission by my learned friend Mr. Conroy that somehow an adverse inference is to be drawn uh, in this appeal or these appeals against the Crown with respect to uh, the effects of marijuana because the Minister of Justice did not respond to a letter that Mr. Conroy wrote to the Minister and saw fit, in my view, inappropriately to copy to this court. Um, the record is the record. And indeed, I would ask the court to bear in mind that prior to the first scheduled hearing of this matter, the Crown filed an application to adduce fresh evidence, being the uh, report prepared by Dr. Kalant, who was the Crown's expert who testified in both the Clay, Clay and Kane matters and whose evidence was, for the most part, accepted, uh, to update the court with respect to uh, developments in the literature, although Dr. Kalant was candid that, quote, nothing had changed. Uh, a week or so ago, uh, Mr. Burstein, on behalf of the appellant Clay, uh, filed an application to adduce the uh, report or affidavit of uh, Dr. Russo, which commented uh, to some extent adversely on the report prepared by Dr. Kalant, but also agreed that nothing had changed. Um, as a result of discussions between uh, the respondent and all of the appellants, including Mr. Conroy, Mr. Malmo Levine, and Mr. Burstein, I wrote a letter to the registrar indicating that both motions were being withdrawn because all of the parties were agreed that nothing had changed. Given that background, I, 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 I dare say it doesn't lie in Mr. Conroy's mouth to come before this court and suggest that somehow an adverse inference should be drawn against the Crown on these appeals because the minister did not respond to his letter. The RJR McDonald case, as pointed out by Mr. Justice Iacobucci, is, is totally different. It's, it's on a par with, with Babcock 
recently decided by this, this court, another case dealing with Section 39 of the Canada Evidence Act, where it was known that there is material in the Crown's possession that should normally be disclosed, but the Crown chose in both of those cases to rely on cabinet confidence. This court said, both in RJR McDonald and, and in Babcock, well, a party, a party that has disclosable material that stands on a privilege or invokes cabinet confidence runs the risk of an adverse inference. It's apples and oranges. So this case, by the agreement of the parties, uh, is to be decided on the record, and it's now to that record that uh, I would like to, uh, I would like to um, briefly uh, turn. Um, if I could ask you to go back in the factum to pages 10 and 11. In paragraph 20, and I'm not going to go through all of the findings of fact, uh, many of them, uh, as I've been able to ascertain, are uh, well known to the, to the, to the court from, from your comments to my learned friends. But in paragraph 20, we have uh, an excerpt from the findings of uh, Judge Howard in, in the Cain case. And at the very foot of the page, um, Her Honor says, there is also a risk that any individual who chooses to become a casual user may end up being a chronic user of marijuana. And of course, the chronic users are one of the vulnerable groups or a member of one of the vulnerable persons identified in the material. And the next finding of fact is particularly telling. It is not possible to identify these persons in advance. And then Her Honor goes on in the next paragraph to refer to the, uh, the fact that there are approximately at the moment 50,000, or at least at the time of the matter uh, being tried before her, approximately 50,000 persons in Canada who fall into the uh, vulnerable group and then says, there is a risk that upon legalization rates of use will increase and that the absolute number of chronic users will increase. Another fact that I would, I would like to highlight, and, and this to some extent uh, relates to a, a submission made but by... He, uh, he seems to be saying that uh, the damage comes from smoking as such, mainly. The damage comes mainly from smoking, but there are vulnerable persons, such as those uh, suffering some, from certain mental disorders, who will have their con condition uh, exacerbated by by not so much the smoking of marijuana, but the active ingredients in marijuana. Mar marijuana, uh, I, if I'm not mistaken, the, the evidence disclosed, at least in terms of smoking, is the tar content of marijuana is higher than the tar content in, in cigarettes. And if you're smoking um, regularly um, several marijuana cigarettes a day, you're into the pack-a-day category. But that's a small portion of the... Uh, group that uses marijuana, that, that, you know, the, the group referred to as the, as the chronic users. So there are a number of health-related issues, not only the, the, not only the one that comes from, uh, from smoking this particular substance. Um, another finding, in fact, made by uh, a learned trial judge who heard a considerable amount of evidence is that 12.5 percent of marijuana users, to, in his words, graduate to heroin and cocaine. So there is a transition from softer to harder drugs. Isn't that just a statistical association that somebody with a predisposition bugs happens to start with marijuana? What it, what it, what it does indicate, Mr. Justice Benny, in my submission, is that, again, uh, putting this together with uh, Judge Howard's findings, that the more people, the more people that uh, choose to smoke, the more people who are vulnerable, the more people who will fall into this percentage who graduate to, to, uh, to um, harder and more dangerous drugs. That, 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 in my submission, is a finding of fact which what? underlines, uh, uh, underlays the, this case. But what is the proper inference? It could just as easily be inferred that the graduation comes from contact with illegal suppliers who promote other illegal products as opposed to uh, an inference that it's the product itself that, that it's true. in that, other words it could be the prohibition that that has that that, that, has that, that has not been fully investigated but but nonetheless it is a fact that there is this graduation or a progression which in my respectful submission is a matter which parliament can take into consideration there is no one here is suggesting as i understand it seriously suggesting that marijuana is a totally benign substance 
Uh, I think it was Mr. Justice McCard who said the jury is still out. But at the end of the day, in my respectful submission, it is for Parliament to weigh and assess the various and competing interests and make a decision. It's, it's, interesting, it's interesting to note, and, and, I, and I'm aware that the court is aware, we've had, we've had two parliamentary committees recently uh, look at this matter and suggest different solutions. The Senate suggests legalization. The Senate committee suggests legalization. The Commons Committee suggests decriminalization. And what uh, I would draw to the court's attention in the, in the Commons Committee report on page 129 is, is, is the following, because this is an obviously a matter in respect of which reasonable people can differ. And in my respectful submission, when reasonable people can differ, can differ, the appropriate form for resolving those differences in our Western democratic society is the elected legislatures, in this case, the Parliament of Canada. The committee said, and I'll, I'll just, if I might just read this short passage from page 129 of the, the majority report. However, the committee shares the concern expressed by many educators, treatment providers, and law enforcement officers, to name only a few, that many Canadians, and youth in particular, might misperceive legalization as evidence that Parliament is not concerned about the widespread use of cannabis. At least as far as this committee is concerned, nothing could be further from the truth. Indeed, the committee was told by various health care professionals, addiction specialists, and treatment providers that frequent and pro prolonged use of cannabis can lead to dependence as well as social problems for certain users. So it, one cannot gainsay, in my respectful submission, on this record, even without supplementing it by recourse to re recent parliamentary committees, whether uh, uh, committees in, of Canadian parliaments or, or foreign parliaments, that there are risks health and social risks associated with um, the uh, use of marijuana. So then it really comes down to, at the end of the day, and I'm going to move to this in, in just a second, who makes the call? Under our constitutional arrangement, which includes not only the Charter, but sections 91 and 92 of what's now known as the Constitution Act 1867, who makes the call? Because in my respectful submission, those opposite me are advocating a shift in the separation of powers doctrine. They are asking that courts ultimately weigh and assess competing interests, and that notwithstanding the fact that this court may be of the view on the test propounded by the respondent, that there is a rational basis for the legislation, because that is the position that, uh, that we advocate. Notwithstanding, you may conclude that there is a rational basis for legislative or parliamentary action, be it uh, at the federal or provincial level. It is under our constitutional arrangement such that courts should then go on and examine it in more detail and decide whether there is enough harm. Do, and you, do you agree that the test is rational basis? Yes. 